Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. This is our last lecture for the semester. It's another interactive lecture, and this time we'll be talking about genre and writing. So first I'd like you to take a moment to do a genre free write. So you should set a timer for 10 minutes, and then keep your pen moving and writing about the following questions. So first, when you hear the word genre, what do you think it means? Second, what positive or negative connotations do you associate with the word? How have you heard it used? And then finally, what experiences have you had related to genre, either in or out of school? So take 10 minutes now and pause the recording. So you probably wrote something about the type of types of text that we use in the literary world. So you might have had things like fiction and nonfiction or high fantasy, science fiction, murder mystery, or those those sorts of text types. Some of you who might have taken Dr. Jenkins class already might have some other things like related to the ways that texts are used in a particular workplace. And so for this lecture, we're going to make some basic assumptions about genre and establish a shared definition. So we can think about genre in two different ways. One is textual, meaning that we can talk about genre in terms of specific types of texts. And these could be written, spoken, or even multimodal, meaning things like websites that draw on multiple systems of meaning. And then secondly, genres give us as readers and writers uh, guidelines for content and organization. So we're going to talk about an example of a cereal box to illustrate this. So we all know when we go get a box of cereal that we can expect certain sorts of textual information as part of the genre of cereal boxes and food more generally, food labels. So we know that if we look at the front of the box, there will be some sort of advertising. Uh, often that advertising is targeting audiences in particular ways. So uh, in the case of Cheerios, it's trying to promote itself as heart healthy. It often has athletes, um, promoting the cereal, that sort of thing. It also gives guidelines for content and organization. So we know if we turn to the side of the cereal box, we can find a, a formatted table that gives us particular nutritional information in a particular order. We know where to find the ingredients list, and we know what the order of the ingredient, ingredients lists means. Um, so all of those are part of the textual genre of the cereal box. But we can also think about genres socially. So um, any kind of genre is a form of communication and interaction, and genres provide clues to us as audience members and as textual producers about how text ought to be interpreted, and they create shared sets of expectations among readers and writers of texts. So if we think about the cereal box, we can also look at it not just as a particular type of text with certain textual features, but we can think about how it engages us as consumers of cereal in a particular form of communication and interaction. So we're engaging with the General Mills company about this product that they've created and want us to purchase and consume. It also gives us clues about how to interpret the text. So the nutrition information uh, guides us through um, how, how we can think about our food as providing certain nutrients to our bodies, for instance. Um, the back of the box, which has an athlete on it, uh, asks us to interpret this particular product as something that engages in health, a healthy behavior, like physical activity. And it also creates shared expectations among readers and writers. So, so this text creates a, a metaphorical contract between what the producers say is in the box 
and what it gives to us as consumers and what we can take away from that box. So uh, even in things that are really mundane in our everyday lives, we can see genre at work. So for the rest of the lecture today, I'm going to talk about several different strategies for building genre awareness with students. The first strategy is cut up paragraphs and essays. And so for this particular strategy, what you would do is take either an essay or a paragraph and cut up the sentences so that you can't really see which sentence goes where, and then have students figure out how to piece them together. And they have to look at the language for clues on how the particular text fits together. So what I'd like you to do is take a moment to do example one. This is a simple sequence, and out of order the se sentence in read, I strongly support PE classes. Secondly, it models healthy behavior. Firstly, it provides students with a way to burn off excess energy. Thirdly, it provides an opportunity for students to develop non-academic skills. And then PE is a vital component in middle school education. So on your exercises page, I'd like you to figure out how do these five sentences fit together to create a coherent paragraph. Pause the recording now. Okay, so based on the textual information I gave you, you should have a paragraph that looks like this. PE is a vital component in middle school education. And so this first sentence sets the stage for the entire paragraph and serves as a topic sentence for the paragraph. And then we have some transition language clues that are really obvious. Uh, so we have, firstly, it provides students with a way to burn off excess energy. Secondly, it models healthy behavior. Thirdly, it provides an opportunity for students to develop non-academic skills. So those transitions, firstly, secondly, and thirdly, let us know what order those three sentences have to be in. And then our last sentence is, I strongly support PE classes. And so this wraps up the paragraph and um, kind of gives a rally cry for the content of the, this particular persuasive paragraph. So now I'd like you to uh, try the second paragraph, which is much more complex than the first one. So take these five sentences and figure out how would you put them together to create a coherent paragraph. Um, in less than 24 hours, a scab forms as the clot dries out. In a simple wound, the first and second layers of skin are severed along with tiny blood vessels called capillaries. Whenever you experience a minor scrape or cut, the body's healing process is immediately called into action. This blood clot, along with its fiber network, begins to join the edges of the wound together. As these vessels bleed into the wound, platelets work with fibrogens to form a clot. So pause the recording now to figure out how would you create a paragraph using these five sentences. So you should have something like this. Um, so your first sentence, the, the most logical sentence for that is whenever you experience a minor scrape or cut, the body's healing process is immediately called into action. So this st sets the stage for the pr process that this paragraph is talking about. It lets us know the topic for the, sun for the paragraph and what we can expect to follow. Uh, and then the next three sentences, the body sentences, use much more complicated language to show why they need to go in a particular order. So the first sentence, we have a clue at the very beginning transition. In a simple wound, the first and second layers of skin are severed along with tiny blood vessels called capillaries. So this sets the the process in action. It lets us know what the process is and what parts of the body are involved. So in this case it's a simple wound and a certain certain layers of the skin are involved. And then we know that the next sentence has to be as these vessels bleed into the wound platelets work with fibrinogens to form a clot. Um, and here we have these vessels pointing back to the end of the previous sentence, vessels called capillaries. 
And then the fourth sentence, this blood clot with its fiber network begins to join the edges of the wound together. So in this case, this blood clot points directly back to the last word of the previous sentence. And then finally, we have a wrap-up sentence at the end. In less than 24 hours, a scab forms as the clot dries out. And so this completes the process that's been described in the paragraph. And it, it tells us that the wound has now been uh, turned into a scab.